Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to get started on section 5.6, where we look at some numerical integration techniques for computing integrals. So before getting started on our first example, I want to motivate this section in general. So I want to look, I'm going to move up here a little bit and look at a function uh, or an integral that we might want to compute. So that function is, I'm going to look at the integral from say zero to one of e to the negative x squared dx. So that function, e to the negative x squared, looks something like this. And if you've taken a probability or statistics class, you might have seen this integral or this function before. So this function, e to the negative x squared, it helps define the normal distribution. So if you've seen something like a bell-shaped curve, which tells you about probabilities and areas, you will have seen this type of function there. Okay, so now e to the x, e to the negative x, e to the negative x squared, these are functions that are kind of, though they might look scary because there's an e involved, there's a negative involved, they come up quite a bit in some natural situations and phenomena. But it turns out for this integral, computing the area under this curve from zero to one, there are no methods available to compute this integral. So we have to compute this integral using an approximation or what's called a numerical method. So, and I'll just kind of say that here. So there's no kind of clever U sub by parts, partial fraction, whatever, way of computing this exact number. So we have to estimate. So if you're interested in doing more engineering and some more in-depth calculations, you might be taking a numerical equations class sometime in your future academic careers. And in such a class or a numerical, numerical methods class, you're going to learn more techniques for computing and estimating values of equations and functions like this. Okay, so in section 5.6, we begin by learning about some of these, what's called numerical integration techniques. So we th should think of this as methods of approximating integral integrals, but methods of approximating them very well. We want to try to get as close to the exact answer as we can. So I'll just write here, numerical integration, like very good approximation like approximation that's so good if we're building a bridge or something that's actually using this integral value, then that's that's good enough for what we need. All right, so let's get started at in this looking at this numerical integration of this first method called the trapezoid rule. So we'll see in the trapezoid rule that this looks really similar to the left and right hand sums that we were computing to approximate areas under a curve. So recall back in our early sections of this class, we're using left and right hand endpoints of rectangles to approximate area. And we can see that if we do that for this particular function and this particular area under the curve, we don't quite get a very good estimate. We miss out on a lot of area or we overshoot quite a bit. So the approach to use is rather than using a shape that's a rectangle, use a trapezoid. So what is a trapezoid? Well, a trapezoid is a quadrilateral, so a four-sided shape with only one set of parallel sides. So if we were to draw in the trapezoids that we'd use to represent this area, I draw in over this first subdivision, a trapezoid connecting the left and right endpoints. And then we can continue. So go ahead and pause the video and fill in on your own the page on your workbook, what the trapezoids for this integral would look like. All right. So now that we've drawn in those trapezoids, we can look ahead that the goal in this first example is to compute the area under the curve F from A to B. So notice A actually starts at this X zero. So I drew one too many trapezoids. That's okay, I'll just erase it here. So what we wanna compute is an approximation of the area under our curve from A to B. 
Okay, and we're going to do that by looking at the areas of these trapezoids that we've drawn here. So I'm going to label my trapezoids just so we have a name to call them. So I'm going to label the first one A sub 1, A sub 2, A sub 3. Maybe I should call them T sub numbers for a trapezoid, but that's okay. A is fine too. Okay. So now we're given some notation. So we're going to let change delta x represent the change from one x in our subdivision to the next, which is also the width of one subdivision, and n be the number of subdivisions. So that means if I start counting at zero, I should have uh, x subs going up to x sub n to get me to v. So just a couple background things here. So that would mean, since my interval goes from A to B, the size or the distance from A to B is B minus A. That's just looking at computing that difference gives us the size between A and B. So if I want to know the size of a delta X, well, I need to divide that B minus A by N, the number of intervals that I have. So delta X is B minus A over N. And you've this should look familiar 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 because we saw this in our work when we were using rectangles to approximate area. Okay, so let's go ahead and write out those areas. So a sub one area would look like delta x times what? Well, okay, what is the area of a trapezoid? So you can Google this, you can look up a geometry book. So the area of a trapezoid is the width of the trapezoid. So the distance between the two parallel sides times the height at one end plus the height at the other end over two. So I'm going to write that using my function notation. So that would look like f of x sub zero plus f of x sub one all over two. So I can stick that two out front. So again, this curve is our f of x. So by evaluating at the first and second sides or first and second endpoints, that would give me the heights of my trapezoid. So I add those together, divide by two, multiply by the width. So then we can continue doing this. So a sub two would look like width delta x times f of x sub one plus f of x sub two over two. Okay, so we could continue doing this for all of our a's here. And I should have, since we have some uh, ellipses here, kind of a dot, 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 and we don't know what n is, so I shouldn't write six there. Our last area, or our last trapezoid, we're going to call a sub n. Keep in mind, because if we label the first one with a one, which is the second endpoint, so then n should be the, the label of our final trapezoid. So as we continue writing these areas for all of our trapezoids, our final trapezoid, a sub n, would look like what? Well, it would still have the change of x, but now the endpoints, if I clear this up, we would evaluate or the, we would compute the heights by looking at x sub n minus 1 and x sub n. So that would look like f of x sub n minus 1 plus f of x sub n all over two. All right, so we have a lot of tools written out for us. Now what we can do is actually combine what we just done with computing these areas of the trapezoid into a nice formula that gives us an approximation of this integral. So let's take a look at what that would start to look like. So approximating that integral would mean adding up the areas of our trapezoid. So that would look a sub one plus a sub two all the way up through a sub n. So notice each a term has an delta x over two in front of it or involved in it. So I can factor out that delta x over two from each term. So what do I have when I do that? What remains? So I have a delta x over two. So now I'm going to multiply that by all of these inside terms. So let's start writing that out to get an idea of what that would look like. So for a1, we'd have 
f of x0 plus f of x1. For the a2 term, we'd have f of x1 plus f of x2. For the a sub 3 term, well, now we'd evaluate at f of x sub 2 and f of x sub 3. So I have here f of x sub 2 plus f of x sub 3. And now we'd keep going all the way until that final trapezoid. So that would contribute an f of x sub n minus 1 plus f of x sub n. All right, close parenthesis. OK, so now if we just take a look at what we've done, you might notice that we have some repeated terms in this sum. So we see that we have an x f of x sub 1 and an f of x sub 1. We have an f of x sub 2, f of x sub 2, f of x sub 3. We'd have another x f of x sub 3 here. So we have some repeated terms which we could combine. So what does that look like? Well, that looks like as we move, continue on until the very end, what we'd have left is pairs of f's until we reach the end where we just have one f of x sub n. So that would look like, if we combined our terms here, are still delta x over 2 times f of x sub 0 plus 2 times f of x sub 1 plus 2 times f of x sub 2 plus 2 times f of x sub 3 plus all the way 2 f of x sub n minus 1 close parenthesis plus f of x sub n. So when computing the area under a curve or approximating an integral using the trapezoid rule, this would be the formula that comes out that we would use. So when you're doing this in a problem in this class or something when you, when you meet a future integral somewhere else, you can either derive this formula, which basically means go through and compute the areas of each of these trapezoids that you draw here, or you could also use what we just created here to simplify things a little bit. And you only need to then evaluate at those endpoints and combine them in this way. Awesome. So we will see some examples of how to use this formula in some upcoming videos. Thanks for watching.